my name is Carolyn. First I am a woman, then I am a wife, and then I am a mother, and then I'm a professional. My husband is called Ellie. We have three boys, Ethan, uh, Elroy, and Eliam. And two dogs, Coco and Chester, and a school, and a few businesses as well. I got pregnant with Ethan when I had just graduated. Um, it was a really difficult time. I think I was very young. I was trying to figure out, you know, what the next move would be. I had just come back from uh, the UK. I just graduated with my law degree, came back to Kenya, was hoping to be admitted to the bar, and then I get pregnant. Uh, so it was a difficult time because uh, the relationship I was in didn't work. So I decided to go back to the UK. And coincidentally, at the same time, my brother, uh, my, my youngest brother, Donald, was taken ill. We subsequently came to find out that he had multiple sclerosis. So I spent another two years in the UK, um, helping my mom out with my brother, and also trying to raise my son by myself. But thank God mom was there, you know? I couldn't have done it by myself. And I think that was an amazing thing. I, I don't know how God works really, because she needed me and I needed her, and we were both there for each other. So, so that worked out really well. The journey with Ethan and uh, autism started much earlier than I actually realized. The reason why I don't think I realized Ethan was autistic was also because we were in such a stressful environment with my brother being ill, and that, was, that sort of took center stage most of the time. But when Ethan was 18 months old, after, his, uh, after a vaccination, um, we noticed that there was a bit of a change in terms of his eye contact, what he likes doing. He was very reclusive. He, was a, he became a loner. He'd play by himself. I'd take him to play groups and, you know, you'd just find him in the corner sort of playing by himself. So my mom and I were, you know, wondering why all of a sudden, you know, he was a bit different. But like, you, like I said, you know, we were in such a stressful environment and my brother being unwell and, you know, being in a foreign country and just trying to figure life out as it, as it was coming. I knew something wasn't right, but I said, I'm not going to deal with it right now. So down the line, we decided to come back home because my brother was given only six months to live. So then we decided, well, you know, if anything does happen, we might as well go home. Um, and as much as we were hopeful, we also, you know, we were trying to figure out the best thing to do with, in the situation. So when we came back home, um, I then took the initiative and, and I was advised to take Ethan to Gertrude's in Modaiga. They have a special clinic called the Special Educational Professionals where um, uh, speech therapists, occupational therapists, a few pediatricians sort of sit in and then just sort of assess your child. If you feel like your child has delayed milestones or some sort of issue that you just don't understand. So when I took him there, I remember them telling us, uh, my mom and I, that um, Ethan was uh, autistic and I was like, what's autism? And I was so puzzled. And I said, okay, well, so what do we do about it now that we know what it is? And they said, well, it's a, it's a lifetime condition and there's nothing you can do about it. And I was like, wow. So this is something that I'm going to have to live with for the rest of my life. And I remember just going back and wondering what could I have done better? What did I do wrong? You know, how am I going to live with this? You know, when will he speak? When will he do what other normal children do, you know? Um, I think I did that for a few months. Um, the first month was the hardest, then it got easier because then I would remind myself, look, this is your journey. 
do the best you can with Ethan and just try and manage it the best way you can. And I remember what really helped me get through it was number one, prayer and the support of my family and friends. And you really need that support. Um, a lot of people are suffering quietly, trying to do it by themselves, trying to figure things out by themselves. And I'm just lucky that my family are very open and very loving and very inclusive and they just want to know how to help and they want to be there for you. So I was very lucky in that sense. Um, it wasn't easy being a single mom, trying to work, trying to raise a child and trying to be mom and dad at the same time. But I was lucky also, I have very many male cousins who are very, uh, they were also very um, positive and always wanting to be there and to help and be part of the journey. And they really enjoyed spending time with Ethan. I was very lucky in that sense. I remember when we were looking for nannies, you would get a nanny and they'd be like, Kwanini umtoto bado kimfundisha vitu aski. Um, you know, you get one, they stay a couple of months, challenges, you know, diet issues, not following through. It was difficult. And then what happened was, we got a really amazing nanny and she stayed with us for eight years. She stayed with us for eight years and she loved Ethan, genuinely loved Ethan and was, you know, she was there for the cause. She, she really helped with potty training. She, we were like a team, you know, and the three of us became like a little family in our home. And it gave me peace of mind. It made me, it helped me focus. It allowed me to focus on other things and just being able to work. Sometimes I'd have to go out of town for work. And, and that gave me peace of mind to focus on my work and do other things. And it allowed me the opportunity to venture into other things as well. And being Ethan's mother just made me um, think outside the box, you know. We, we lived a very unconventional life and, you know, it wasn't the normal day-to-day -day routine that probably other families have. It was very different. But we, we, got, we got it right. In our home, everything worked well. So that gave me peace of mind. We were doing occupational therapy at the time. The problem was um, we lived in an area where, well, at the time, this was around, what, 2007, 2008? There weren't many occupational therapists. I didn't know many. I only knew one. And she, it was a Dutch lady who lived in Lower Cabete. So we actually used to drive all the way down to Lower Cabete, do our sessions and come home. There wasn't any occupational therapy or speech therapy in the school. So Ethan generally would go to school, play, just uh, which was good for him, learn how to socialize and then come home. So that was really the journey. Up until we, we went to a certain uh, kindergarten and there was an amazing teacher. He was very concerned about Ethan, Ethan's development and his growth. And thank God for amazing people who just go the extra mile to, to try and help us figure things out, you know. It was just a journey of discovery, trying to figure out how to do things. You know, what is Ethan good at? How can we help him with literacy? How can we help him with maths? How can we help his social skills, his creative side as well, you know? Ethan has been improving consistently. Um, I think the first intervention we took towards uh, managing uh, his condition was diet. And that has really helped. Ethan was very hyper. <laughs> we couldn't do much. Like everywhere we'd go, Ethan would be bouncing up and down, running up and down. Uh, we'd go into the supermarket. He'd, you know, have a meltdown if you couldn't have anything in the supermarket. But just accepting the whole situation the way it was helped me just get through things much easier. And I think a lot of parents are shying away, hiding their children, and just, you know, what, they're always worried about what will people say. 
what will they think, how do they perceive us. Um, and, I, and I just, I just, I just used to wonder, you know, why can't we just have a society that is inclusive? One that doesn't judge people, but it's not that way. But you've just got to grow thick skin and you've just got to just say, you know what, this is my journey. I'm going to embrace it. And the moment you embrace it, everybody will join in and will want to know, you know, what, you know, why is eaten this way? You know, people, there were employees in, a, in Uchumi that were so open with us, that used to ask me, you know, why is it in this way? How did it become this way? And I would sit and tell them about our story and our journey because we used to shop there so much that, you know, they just, they, they, they just couldn't stop not, not wondering, you know, what we were about because we were a bit different, you know? So Ethan was hyper then, but with a diet, he got very calm and with a, it was a very structured environment. Breakfast at this time, school, lunch, uh, uh, dinner, and then bedtime. So my nanny helped me maintain that routine. And she was a mature lady, no distractions, very focused, came there, knew what she wanted to do, and she just came and, you know, we got the routine going. So that really helped with Ethan's stability in terms of his growth. Uh, there was no sugar, we removed the wheat, and then we removed dairy. So Ethan was either on uh, almond milk or on no dairy at all. Like, we would use other substitutes. We tried a bit of soya, he didn't quite like it, so we went to almond milk. And then we would do porridge, we would do matoke, we'd do sweet potato, we'd do nduma. The beauty about Ethan is he ate whatever you gave him. I think if, if you get a child used to a certain pattern of doing things and, and, and you establish it, I think they just sort of roll with the punches, yeah. Our biggest challenge has been speech. It's been on and off, on and off. Um, and we've accepted it. We, we, we just said, you know, Ethan will speak when he wants to speak, you know, and we'll give him the support and the intervention that he requires to get him there, you know? As a teenager, Ethan is um, very calm, very tall, taller than me now. Um, loves puzzles, uh, loves basketball, and is uh, trying his hand in cooking, but is afraid of the fire, so that's funny. <laughs> I don't know how you cook without touching the fire. Um, yeah, so Ethan is sort of morphing into his own character, very calm and uh, confident in himself. And we just look forward to the day where he'll be able to take a little more initiative into doing his own things and just becoming his own man, you know? And maybe one day with his own family. Uh, yeah, uh, that's really my heart's desire. Up until three years ago, yeah, I met an amazing man and um, I think it was very interesting when he came into the picture, in, uh, seeing Ethan and him interacting, and, and I realized, wow, only a man can teach another man how to be a man, you know? How, the, only a man can teach a boy how to become a man. My role was to nurture him, but when Ellie came into the picture, Ethan, Ethan changed, he became more confident, Karma, and uh, he had this guy that he was emulating, that they used to do things together with, you know? I was his mom. I was used to doing things for him and smothering him and always worrying, oh, will he be okay? But when Ellie came, he reminded me that we need to let Ethan be his own man and learn to do things for himself and just try and let him 
you know, discover himself, discover things for himself, try to learn things for himself. How do we know his capacity if we don't, if we don't allow him to try those things for himself? So, in that sense, he brought that stability and, and, and the grounding. So that was wonderful. And Ethan now has two more brothers and uh, it's been very nice to see them interacting. Um, you know, he's sort of been very reclusive and alone for a very long time, but his brothers, they always want to see him. They want to see what's he doing? What is he up to? They look up to him, you know, what is he doing? When he's doing his puzzles, they want to join in and they want to be part of that. And, and it's been very nice. So I'm so glad that, you know, God allowed that, you know, our journey took the turn that it did. So I'm really grateful for that. Our school is called Haven Cottage and uh, we just started it. It's not even been more than a year yet. So we're still a startup, very tiny. It's nice, then we get to know our children on a one-to-one -one basis. It's been very nice. Uh, we have children on the autism spectrum and some also on the who have cerebral palsy. Um, and it's been wonderful. And I think it's great because Ellie and I, then we get to do these things together and our children get to see us grow as well. And we get time, we, we get to spend time with Ethan, we get to see him grow and, and nurture him and other children as well at the same time. Ellie volunteered in an autistic school in the UK, so he actually had a lot of knowledge in terms of schooling structures and, and secretly I also had this um, wish and idea, this dream that maybe one day I could start a school as well. And then when we met, it just came and it happened. And I think it's God's doing because what are the chances that, you know, he volunteered in a school in the UK and we'd never met. And then I have this autistic child as well. And I don't know, it's just God's doing. So it's not that we didn't want Ethan to go to another school. It's just that I guess God wanted us to open our doors to other children as well and, and help them as well. Raising Ethan was bittersweet um, because obviously God never gives you more than you can handle. And then also um, because he wasn't your normal conventional child, you have to think outside the box. You have to go out of yourself. You have to figure things out for yourself, you have to try and understand things on a deeper level. You have to grow thick skin because of the way people are, or the comments you will always receive and the questions, unsolicited advice that you don't need sometimes. Um, and then also being alone and trying to figure it out alone. I mean, ideally, God purposed that, you know, a man and a woman will raise a child together. Imagine when you're a single mother with a child with special needs, trying to figure it out, trying to make, earn a living at the same time. But that allowed me to think outside the box. It ended, made me do things which I never even imagined I would do, amazing things. Um, and then it also brought me out of myself and it helped me encourage other parents who are now, you know, struggling with the same thing, you know? So I, I, I am so grateful that God allowed this to happen so that I could become the person I am right now. I don't think I would have been the person I am without, without um, our autism. And I'm happy for it and I'm glad for it. Elro is very chatty. <laughs> he has an opinion about everything. I think it was actually quite easy raising Ethan because Ethan is very very obedient child. I'm not saying Elro is not obedient, but Ethan, Ethan will just pretty much just go with the flow of whatever is happening. Um, apart from the days when he has meltdowns and you have to manage those, and it can happen anywhere, in a function, at home, at the supermarket, in the car, way somewhere, and then you'd have to turn back and go home. And uh, with his brothers, also trying to figure out why he's away, he is, doesn't talk much, doesn't say much, but the amazing thing is, we were worried about the kids' milestones. 
um, say sometimes I'd copy Ethan and we were worried they'd not be able to tell the difference between, you know, the autism and what is normal. But for some reason, it's just worked itself out. Like, Elroy is perfectly okay, does his things the way he does them. His speech is fantastic. He has a very wide vocabulary, very chatty. And his younger brother is picking up from him very fast. And they are very loving and very inclusive of Ethan. And they love following him around. And they just want to be part of him. And they just want to learn from him. And that's been amazing, yeah. I would say to them, don't try and do it by your own strength. Just pray. Let God lead you, let him guide you. Our strength runs out, but his grace is always sufficient for us. That will never run out. And I, I, I wasn't very spiritual before, but now I encourage other parents to just tap into their spiritual side and just let God guide you in that journey. You know, that journey of faith, that journey, you know, tomorrow you don't know what will happen. Even you don't know what will happen tomorrow. None of us know what will happen tomorrow. It's the same thing for everybody. And look for the positive, look for the thing that God, there's a reason why God allows things to happen the way they, that he does. And once you find that thing and that purpose, I think, I think life will be so much easier to get by. It will be easier for you to walk through it. And you won't beat yourself down. You won't keep asking us. You won't moan and, and you won't feel sorry for yourself. You will just embrace it and you will, it will become a blessing as opposed to a curse. Other people look at it that way, but I've always looked at it as a blessing, yeah. If Ethan tomorrow uh, is no longer autistic, I would still do what I'm doing for a school and would still do what we're doing right now. Nothing would change because we have come into our purpose. We have figured out why God allowed this to happen. And I think this is why he allowed it to happen, yeah.